We'd like to welcome uh, everyone to Wednesday night Bible study at Sugarland Church of Christ. We're delighted to have you, whether you're in person or online. Uh, tonight we have uh, Brother Parker filling in, and we're still covering the book of Acts. Uh, let us go to God in prayer. Merciful God, we're so grateful, Father. You give life, you sustain life, your life, hope, joy, peace, and love. And Father, we're just grateful to have the frame of mind to come out this afternoon and glean a portion of your holy and divine word, knowing that make application of your word to our life. Father, would not only make us better, but more in tune with your will and your way. Your word is life and spirit. And we pray, Father, even as we listen attentively to your word being taught, that we allow your word to enter into the deep recesses of our heart, mind, soul, and spirit. Guide and direct us, fashion us into the life of Jesus Christ. And Father, we are so grateful to be part of the body of Christ. Lord, we would like to invite everyone to be a part of the body of Christ by obeying the gospel, being the recipient of the spiritual blessings that you have blessed us all in. Bless the congregation, Father, those that are sick among us, those that are on beds of affliction, those that mourn and are heavy laden. Lord, we pray that you lift them up, strengthen them, heal them, and help them to overcome whatever challenge they face. Forgive us for anything contrary to your will. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. We thank Brother Smith for leading us in prayer. Y'all doing okay this evening? Not so much. So Acts chapter 21, Acts 21, that's where we'd be on this evening. Uh, uh, before we get started, anybody have any um, questions or comments about anything that we've covered in Acts thus far? We've, we've been in Acts for quite some time, and so we've covered a lot of material, uh, some probably too quickly, just because the way that, that the, the, uh, the book is, is set up. And um, so there, there's a lot. So do we have any questions or comments about anything that we've covered over the last couple months? Anybody, anything? Y'all, y'all match the book back. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's a lot of material in Acts. It's, it's narrative. Uh, there's uh, multiple speeches. There's a few defenses. There, there's just so many different literary genres as you read throughout uh, the book of Acts that that adds value to. Uh, uh, how we interpret it and and, uh, and how we apply it in today's time. And so uh, what things are you seeing thus far from Acts? Uh, are there any things or anything that's standing out to you? Um, you know, yes, sir. Like the emphasis on uh, community. You know, we talked yeah. about that early on. And, yeah. You know, how uh, in today's time, church has become a two-day a week and Sunday Wednesday yeah. as yeah. opposed to early church. Day to day, they were interacting with each other, mm -hmm. fellowshipping. You know, there was nothing for worship to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. I think there's enough of that that's happening in yeah. today's time. Yeah. You know, and it's always ironic to me every time I think about this how that the early church did not have the the modes of tech, the modes of transportation, nor the avenues of technology that we have today. We have the ability to. Uh, to have um, uh, access to one another from all parts of the world, even. Um, and however, it seems as if we are more distant today than the early church was then. And, and uh, um, don't know why that is, but unfortunately, that seems to be the case. Yes? Uh, in the book of Acts, um, is a lot about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit has guided many of the followers there, yeah. you know, the, the uh, uh, apostles. Mm -hmm. And I remember Brother Duck saying last week that this book could have been about acts of the Holy Spirit because um, it touched the lives of, of 
so many. And yeah. there were those parts that they had. So that's what stood out for me about how the Holy Spirit really worked in the lives of the apostles. Yeah. yeah. All the way from Acts 1. I mean, you see that all the way from Acts 1. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure we often call it Acts of the Apostles, but the fact is, is that it's the Holy Spirit that we see acting all throughout. Um, and and, and it, it's, it's very noticeable from Acts 1. Uh, but, but um, you know, but yeah. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, also, um, with Acts, it gives a lot of clarity to a lot of the letters that Paul wrote. Yeah. Um, so it gives you kind of like that, not necessarily just a background, but also it gives you <laughs> Um, yeah, it's almost like the road, not roadmap, what do you call it, like a linear type of mm -hmm. uh, timeline yeah. uh, of what actually happened yeah. uh, from the from the start of the early church and throughout. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like that because then when you go back and you read a lot of the letters, then you can kind of fill in where right. things happened along that mm -hmm. line. So I like to look at it as a, a New Testament kind of uh Timeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the, the number of the guys have gone through uh, the, the the travel and, and, uh, and the, uh, what you call them the journey. Your journey, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said, and they go back and, and, and check on them. Yeah, yeah. You go back and reinforce and support them. I, I, and that's something that I thought was impressive because often I feel like we can be more supportive of, of new converts or with new congregations and stuff. I like the way they support it. Don't leave me out by myself, you know. Yeah. Support, yeah. Definitely, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yes, sir. Yeah, we just I was thinking about the in the first part of Acts, you know, started off with Peter yeah. doing the preaching and you know, focus on Peter. And then when and uh, after Acts chapter 10, you know, Paul started taking mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. And so from that point, you know, Paul is all the way to the end. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so we, you know, it's just kind of divided, you know, just the two apostles, Peter and Paul, kind of took care of all right. Of them. Absolutely, that's a good point. That's a good point, yes, sir. Yeah, in my day, I was there to see of, mm -hmm. of Paul. Um, uh, initially, Christ told him he had to suffer uh, many things for his name. And just how he met the cha challenges, he went swaying to the left or the right. He was, you know, uh, very forthcoming uh, with the message. And, and uh, I admire the quality, not only him, but the first century church. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it seemed like it was an urgency, uh, not only to spread the gospel, to, but to teach and preach to people uh, that uh, that didn't have salvation. It was like the only hope was uh, presented the, the gospel. And he, he went to great lengths of suffering to uh, make it possible that uh, not only Jews be saved, but also the Gentiles. Yeah, yeah, and that 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 is a charge that Paul took so seriously. You know that 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 uh, you know, he even said, I, I, you know, for me, he said, I don't even. It doesn't matter if I die. You know, this, this is something that was so important to him. And um, so uh, so what? Why is that? Why why do we see this 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 movement from from the early church, the apostles, Peter specifically, to Paul. Why, why do y'all think that is? Because that, that's something I, uh, I observed as well, uh, Brother Isaac, and I think I think it's a lot to that. Uh, so why, why do we think that is? Yes, sir. Well, I'm slowly merging uh, the, uh, the law yeah. to the gospel from the Jews to the Gentile. Mm -hmm. It's just a continuation to finally put all parties together. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yes, yeah, but when you think about it, knowing that um, Peter, you know, he was there with um, mm -hmm. Jesus and so was able to carry on a lot. Like he got things, him and some of the other apostles, well, the other apostles, they got direction as to what to do. And so when Paul came into the scene, it was good because he had um, also learned of. The, the law and all of that mm -hmm. was very dedicated to it, but also he knew the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, with just his nature and who he was as a person, you know, he was able to really do a lot of the things that were, uh, what would you call it, almost scary to do, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because he was just that type of guy, yeah. you know, and so the work that he was given, 
it was specifically given to him and you can see him being able to carry that out just from looking at his personality traits from the beginning. Yep, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yes, sir. Um, for me, um, what stands out of Acts is it's the first time we get to see the Holy Spirit go into me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was to before then. Mm-hmm. So now we have the comfort. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a big change in life. Mm-hmm. Say something like to bring comfort in two man. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's what stood out to me. No, it's a good point. It's a lot, a lot of activity in the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and, and uh and, and so uh, you, you see the, 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 the action of the Holy Spirit in various measures. And no, it's excellent. excellent. Yes, sir. Uh, to your point about why the transition mm-hmm. uh, from Peter to Paul is prophecy. Yep. It's prophesied yeah, that you know, the salvation was start with the Jews, mm-hmm. you know, and, and move it to the Gentiles that were mm-hmm. wrapped it in. Yeah. Uh, Peter yeah. connected with the Jews, and Paul was. You know, one one of the things about Luke, Luke, Luke was very educated, right? You know, he he, he was educated, and, and um, you, Luke, you you could tell, you you could, as you walk throughout his treatises, you know, uh, well, one reason why there was a lot about Paul is because Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, right? You know, uh, Mark, you know, John Mark was 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 with Peter. And so that's why we have the Gospel of Mark, right? Because because uh, um, you know a lot of a lot of uh, what Mark uh, research came you know from the Apostle Peter, so a lot of Luke's research came from the Apostle Paul. That was his traveling companion, and so Luke just uh, Luke wrote more than Mark. Mark, I guess. So, so he wrote Luke, and then he wrote the Book of Acts. But also Luke, being such an educated and gifted writer, he employed a lot of different literary genres, like we discussed earlier. And so what he would do was just take stuff and the, he, he would put stuff in a certain order for a certain effect. And so what you see throughout the book of Acts is um, how that the gospel would eventually, it, it, it went to the, notice his thesis statement, and y'all heard me say this a thousand times, his thesis statement is Acts 1-8, right? And so everything that happened after Acts 1-8 happened in that exact order. And, and so what Luke did was show how that the gospel began in Jerusalem, which which is prophecy, you know Isaiah two two, um, yeah Isaiah two two and uh, well Isaiah two two one one verse is the Bible says something one time then that's good enough for me. Right? So uh, it's prophecy, so that that is going to start in Jerusalem. The word of God will come forth from Jerusalem. So it started there, but then it began to spread. And so what you have in the transition from Peter to Paul, from uh, Peter to to Paul, you know, is how that the gospel left Jerusalem and started going uh, to the Gentiles. And you see that specifically in Acts chapter 21 is what we'll be this evening. But let me read the first few verses and, and we'll talk about a few of the things that stick out, uh, specifically community and Holy Spirit, like y'all mentioned earlier. Acts 21 verses 1 through, uh, let's go down to about, I don't know, 11 or something. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Cos the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And finding a ship settled over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding the Cyprus, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went our way. On our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of that city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were with um, Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with them. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied, and as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he came, when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from the place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they just gave up on Paul. They said, Paul is going to do what he wants to do anyway. <laughs> so verse 14 says, So when we, when he would not be persuaded, we see, saying, The will of the Lord be done. 
So a couple things that you see here. Community. Community. So they came to one place and they stayed with those saints. They stayed with that church for seven days. Seven days they, that, that church offered hospitality. And granted, remember, this was a guy who used to be a he, he was a killer to these people. Paul had such animosity towards Christians, you know, that he was willing to arrest them and have them questioned and kill them. Maybe. But now you see a church who's welcoming this guy, who's not only forgiving, but extending grace and welcoming Paul. And so welcoming even to the point that they care about him so much that they said, look, we don't want you to go to Jerusalem. You know, why, why, why go there? But notice what, what you see here is a scene. You know, if, you know, Luke, well, not just Luke, a lot of biblical writers, you know, the way that they write um, is, it could be divided into scenes. And this is a scene, like you watch a scene of a show, you know, this is a scene. And uh, when you're able to put the scene into your mind, you're able to see a lot of straight up emotion. And um, this is the first time, matter of fact, it said that, they knelt down together as a group, as a church. Paul was, and his companions were with this church for seven days. They knelt down. This church accompanied Paul outside of the city. They, they, they walked with Paul to, they wanted to ensure his well-being and, and Paul's companions. And then as a group before Paul left, they knelt down and they just prayed together. That's the scene, the image that Luke has given us. They just prayed together. Now, that scene just recently happened, right? Yeah, right back. So Paul, Paul was in, I don't know, the leaders or somewhere. So he summoned, he summoned the elders from Ephesus, right? And, and so upon summoning them, he told them this whole speech that he had. And then, then, then he informs them, look, I've been y'all preaching for three years. And y'all, 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 y'all saw the life that I lived among you, but he warned them too. That's from some of your own will come people who will draw away disciples after themselves. But then it says that they kneeled down and did what? Paul prayed over them. And, and so they is as if the grass was so tight they did not want to let Paul go. Why? Because Paul had told them, this is it. This is it. This is going to be the last time y'all see my face. Because I got to go to Jerusalem and I don't even know what's going to happen to me there. So the reason, based on the fact that Paul told them that, they did not want to let Paul go. Let's read it for ourselves. I believe it puts privilege. Verse 37 of Acts 20. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Just like the church a few days later, would accompany Paul and his group to the outside the city. You have this group accompanying Paul to, to the ship. They cared about him. But notice the very first verse of the next chapter. Now it came to pass that when it parted from them that set sail right straight course, it was difficult for them to part. You know, it's as if they were clinging. That's love. That's communion. And now they meet up with another church, and that church is showing them hospitality and communion. But another thing we see also is the activity of the Spirit, because watch what it says in one of these verses here. In verse 4, in verse four and find the disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. What does that mean? They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. What do we think about that? You know, interestingly enough, it was the Spirit who told Paul that he was going to go to Jerusalem. Is the Spirit conflicted? Has the Spirit changed his mind? Let's look at Acts 20. Let's go back to Acts 20 and let's look at verse. I'm trying to find it here. Uh, Twenty-two. And see, this is Paul speaking. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. So Paul was being guided by the Spirit to go into Jerusalem. So now in this verse, in Acts 21, it says here that the, 
that they told Paul through the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. What is, what is going on here? A conflict? Come on. So what we have here is that these disciples are being led by the Spirit in being informed that Paul would go to Jerusalem. So the, the, they're being led by the Spirit in that they are being informed that Paul needs to go to Jerusalem. However, it was their, of their own, emotions. yeah, of their own emotions that they're saying, "Please, please, brother, don't go, don't go." Yes, ma'am. And I don't know if they knew that. Um, well, I guess they were fake wolves, no, because they were with him when he left after he summoned the people, the elders from Ephesus. His companions were, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. His companions were with him. Yeah. But those who were there in, what was it, my... The new place. Yeah, the new yeah, place. No they yeah. might not have known no. what mm -hmm. Paul had stated to exactly. the elders about, you know, listen, I already know that, Absolutely. you know, nothing good, yep. per se, mm -hmm. um, is going to be me that I'm going to be, you know, Going through some things. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, sir. We like to uh, reference that passage that talks about trying the spirit by the spirit. Yeah. 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 Um, this is. I think this is an example where yeah. uh, you know good intentions were there, mm -hmm. but like you read earlier, where Paul had to tell them, "Hey, look, like y'all breaking my heart. Yeah. I already know what it is that I have to do. Yeah. The spirit has me. So yeah. I say that you know they were you know God fearing people, mm -hmm. but you know the spirit had already expressed me." Told him what was going to happen. Absolutely. And that, that's a good point. So they left this place after spending seven days here. They left this place and they spent a, a whole nother day uh, after they came to Ptolemaeus. Um, uh, they greeted the brother there, stayed one day, and then on the next day they traveled to Caesarea. Then that's where they came to the house of Philip the Evangelist. You know, so now some more. So you, what you see is that everywhere Paul goes, he has somebody. See, once we become children of God, there's always somebody. We have brothers and sisters everywhere. And that's what we see about the communal nature of the book of Acts. You see a sense of community where this church loved each other. Even when they didn't know each other, they loved each other. And wherever Paul will go, although he'll be arrested and all this other kind of stuff, the fact is, is that there's always people there. We as a church, we got to get back to that. Well, if I go to a different state, I'm calling ahead. And there's somebody there. No matter where we go, there is somebody there that would extend unto us hospitality. Yeah, I see something. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, and I was going to say, because they could trust him. And that yeah. was another thing. Because, like he told them, uh, you know, they could trust him. And they could the whole time that I was with you, I didn't covet. Yep. You know, I worked with my own hands mm -hmm. to, to provide for my needs. And that's that's deep because honestly, you know, the church should be of course providing helping to provide for Paul because he's doing, you know, the work. Yeah. But he's letting them know, like, you know what I did. I provided for for myself with my own hands. I didn't cover anybody. I told you guys exactly what you needed to know. And so that's that's huge when you have um, someone who's leading you and you see their works and you see what they're doing and you know that you know they're not trying to get over there. It's it's nothing about them. It is only about God. And that was that was like just a good part of seeing you know who Paul was and how they attached themselves to him Absolutely. and why they attached themselves. And he was trustworthy. One reason because he was so transparent. Like even yeah. when he would collect money to bring to other places, yeah. he was like, "You know what? Send that brother with me." Yeah, you know, yeah. And so he was very transparent, and open about what he was doing. Yes, sir. I'm tag team with my wife. Yeah. Uh, the, the flip side of it is Paul also knew the pizza. Like, yeah. He established relationships with him. Yeah. And you see in his greetings and salutations in his letters, hey, tell such and such over yeah, there. Yeah, you yeah. know, we're thinking about them. Greet them for us mm -hmm. because you know they were faithful in serving us when we were there. So yeah, I think cool. that's. It speaks to the personal relationships. It does. Know. It does. Yes, sir. Hey, man, I mean, it's, it's, in that culture, there were some who did do it, but people like Billy say, mm -hmm. and so uh, he had, when he, if, if he didn't go me and do that, 
people rose to then trust him. But had he gone in immediately, they might have thought he like the rest of them who did it, but what he called, quote, the belly sake. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, absolutely, that's a good point. And so he, so while he was at Philip's house, right, then you have another uh, another prophet coming, this being who Agabus, right? So Agabus, being like one of the Old Testament prophets, he comes and takes Paul. Uh, I don't know how he got it. I don't know how he got Paul's belt. The Bible didn't tell me that. But he, he takes Paul's belt and bound it around his own hands and feet and says, whoever is belt, who, whatever man this belt belongs to, this is what's going to happen to him if he goes to Jerusalem. He's going to be bound on hand and feet. And so, uh, so then Paul responds. He says, uh, well, first, the, uh, what the Agabus says, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns his belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. But notice what Paul says. Paul says, what do y'all mean? Because they're telling him, y'all don't, please, Paul, don't go. Paul said, what do y'all mean by weeping, breaking my heart? For I'm not only ready to be bound, he said, y'all, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die. You know, which death wasn't the Lord's will for him at this point. But Paul said, I am. I'm, I'm ready to die. So what happens after that? He leaves and goes where? He goes where he had been appointed to go all along in Jerusalem. Now, this is where you see an a interesting twist in the book of Acts. He goes to Jerusalem. He's reject, the gospel is rejected in Jerusalem. So then the gospel, <coughs> after, he, after, after he leaves Jerusalem, God appears to him and says, now, just as you preach the gospel in Jerusalem, you're going to have to preach it in Rome. So you see this twist, this turn from the gospel going to the Jews first. And then, which was Paul's method all along. Every city he came into, he first went to the synagogue. And when he would get kicked out of the synagogue, then he said, you know what? I'm going to take the message of the Gentiles just as y'all over here. And so that's kind of how the whole thing is. is, is, is that's that's the, the method that Paul uses, but that's also the method with which Luke was writing. And so now you see him appear at Jerusalem. So what happened to go to Jerusalem? He meet with James, right? He, he meet with James and the and the whole well, as the Bible tells that he goes and meet with James, but the elders of the church were also there, right? And they give him they give him this advice, right? What was that advice? Yeah. yeah, to make peace. So they said, look, we got four people here. We got four people, they made a bomb. So what y'all do is go, Paul, you pay for him. You pay for these guys to you know get their shaved head. Do their vow, get their shaved head, get their head shaved, do the vows and do all that, Paul. You pay for them. Yeah. Which is which is interesting of itself because I don't know what funds Paul was going to use. Now, working with the presumption that Paul was actually delivering funds to Jerusalem. Let's look at Romans 15:31. Romans 15:31. Because when Paul collected the funds, he wanted to take it to Jerusalem, but he did not even know whether or not the saints at Jerusalem were going to be able to accept the money. So Acts 15, I mean Romans 15, 31. Let's see. It says, well, let's verse 30. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So he did not even know whether or not they'll even accept the funds that he collected. But the fact is, for him to get there and then to tell him to pay for this guy's stuff, if, if that was at the, this occasion where he was delivering these funds, that would have come from money that it should have come from. And so um, what we see here is him getting at, and don't know. So they, he, they gave this advice, and Paul, he used his advice. And then what happened after that? All chaos broke loose, right? But it was God's will. Yeah. It was God's will all along. And so what? So let's 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 read what happened. Because here's the thing: the the church had grown so large. The Church of Christ Jerusalem was so big at that point, probably without people. And so, but the fact is that they they were many of them were very strict Jews. Many of them still kept the Jewish law, which Paul wasn't necessarily against. But they still kept the Jewish law. And also within that church, you had some Pharisees as well. Right? And so it says here, and after those days we packed up when Jerusalem, also some disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain nation of Cyprus, 
uh, early disciples who were, were large. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brother received his gladly. That's the answer to his prayer right there, right? In Romans 15, he was like, y'all pray for me that they'll even, you know. And, and so on the following day, Paul went in with us. So we, as a group, they all went in to meet with James. It says that all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who had believed. And they are all zealous for the law. In other words, you see how you see how large this church has grown. All these Jews are here, but guess what? They are zealous for the law. It says, uh, "But they have been informed about you. They heard something about you, Paul, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the custom." <laughs> what then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We are four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. And that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk arduous and keep the law. But concerning the, so they, so they, you know, say, okay, well we, not that they believe, you know, because they knew what Paul but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and assigned that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Where are the apostles, by the way? This was, this, this was James and the elders. Where are the apostles? More than likely, they were going about the Lord's business, right? Yeah, that's, that's what God told them. He said, Jesus told them to do what? To go. So I assume that that's what they were doing. And, and uh, and so, um, so, so anyway, so it says that, so that's what, and so what, what did Paul do? Paul took that advice. Then Paul took the men the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple, announced the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each of them. After seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia saw, um, see him in the temple, stirred up the crowd, and laid hands, because they presumed that he brought a Greek into the temple. Notice verse 29, say, for they had previously seen trough. Trophim is the Ephesian with them in the city, and they supposed that they brought Paul into the temple. So after that, that all this is what set in motion the chain of events that got called, that got Paul beaten, busted, and arrested. And so Paul was arrested, and so he eventually gives his defense. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 22 is Paul's defense. You know, he's, he, he tells the commander, hey, can I talk to these people? You know, the, the, uh, the commander uh, said, yeah. Actually, the commander, he talks to the commander in Greek. Watch this. This is how brilliant Paul is. Actually, we see Paul's brilliance through his defense. So he talks to the commander in, in Greek. So he said, can I talk to these people? The commander said, you speak Greek? Wait a minute. Ain't you that Egyptian that get all these people killed? Which truly happened. We just don't know. I mean, I, I, mean, I, mean, I guess, I mean, this guy says, are, are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Now, this is not only documented in the Bible, this is documented in Jewish antiquity, historical antiquity, by the Jewish writer Josephus. Now, the difference is that Josephus said there was like 30,000, whereas this guy says 4,000. But, you know, tomatoes, potatoes. <laughs> so when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs in motion with his hand to the people. Watch this. He spoke Greek to the guy. And there was a great silence, and then he spoke Hebrew to the people. Paul gave his defense. He said, all this stuff happened. I met Christ on the road to Damascus. And guess what? They were listening to him. They were listening to him the whole time until verse 21. What happened in 21? What did Paul say in 21 that drove them crazy? Then he said, then Jesus said, depart for I will send you far from here to who? To the Gentiles. Verse 22 said, and they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. This same crowd that initially said, away with him, away with him. Why does that sound familiar? Yeah, almost 30 years ago, they said the same thing. They said, away with him. Crucify him. 
And so now they're saying for the Apostle Paul, away with him. They said, this guy don't even deserve it to live. So you see this Jewish Gentile animosity in the city of Jerusalem. Those strict Jews wanted so badly to kill Paul. Mm. Where were the Jews from the church? Yeah. Yeah, where, where were they? None of them seem to have come to Paul's defense. Interesting. Is it interesting how we could allow society to impact our stances, our views, our actions? And so, I, I don't know. I, I you know, we, we asked the question, but the best we could do probably is to speculate, and, and I'm not comfortable with that. So we, I'm, I'm more comfortable just sticking to what thus, thus says the scriptures, and the scriptures are solid on this, so I think we should be as well. But it does make you wonder. It does make you wonder that you have a lot of Jews who are now Christians. Now, granted, many of them are still holding firm to the Jewish law, but they're now Christians. And you see all this hospitality that was given to Paul in all these cities he's been through, and now he's in Jerusalem. Took the money, and the first thing he's told is to try to make peace with these people by doing this. And then, okay, okay, he does it, and then he gets arrested. But at the end of the day, what we see is that it was the Lord's will for him to go to Jerusalem. <coughs> so he gives this long defense, and then it determines that Paul is a Roman citizen. And then in chapter 23, I'm, I'm briefing over it, y'all, because this is just, it's, it's just it's too long. I, mean, I just, I don't, it's, it's, it's ridiculously, I mean, you, you, you cannot cover three chapters in an hour, at least if you want to get something from it. And so it, it's, uh, so it says that, then Paul looked earnestly at the council, man and brother, I live in all good consciences, all this stuff. And, and, um, and then it says, watch this, that Paul looked up and noticed that there are Sadducees and Pharisees in a group. Paul, being the smart dude he is, he said, you know what, I'm a Pharisee. My dad was a Pharisee. He says, the reason I'm on trial today is because of my belief in the resurrection. Why did Paul say that? Yeah, yeah, because the Pharisees believed in the resurrection and angels and so forth. The Sadducees did not. So as soon as he said that, it started a debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The debate got so heated that they had to send secret service in. <laughs> I say secret service. In our form of secret, they, they sent in the, the soldiers to violently take Paul and haul him off because the, the, uh, the authority <coughs> was afraid. They're about to tear this guy to pieces. That's, that's, how, that's how Luke put it. And Luke was a doctor, so I believe him. It says, let me see, how, how, how Luke said. Luke says uh, in verse 10, now when there arose a great dissension, the commander fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. So they had to go in and rescue Paul because now that Paul is in Jerusalem, there's this great dissension that's occurring in the city where the Romans, who normally wouldn't care, they said, y'all do your own thing. As long as there's not too much of a tumult, y'all do your own thing. We don't care. But as soon as there's evidence of a tumult occurring, you know, then that's when Rome will step in. So Rome had to step in. You know, that they had to step in here. And so um, so they stepped in, had to rescue Paul. <sighs> we covered so much in the last 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was 30 This had went by so fast. Let me stop and let's 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 move from from you know the, the text to the context. What does all this mean for us? It's a lot, I know. Yes, sir. Well, I think for one thing, uh, even when we allow ourselves sometimes, we have to take a stand on the right based on God's word. And a lot of times, you find yourself alone to take a stand. Yeah. But I think in this case, which Paul did, although he had to be troubled, I believe that's what we have to do sometimes. Because 
But we're doing all like you said, we're going over the status quo. We're no different from anybody else. Yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, we just like everybody. We just like the rest of the world. You know, and, and, and that's why we're called to something different. You know, I, I believe that as children of God, we're called to a different standard, a different level of, of living. And and um, and there should be something different about us. We shouldn't look like the rest of the world. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just looking at the uh, mounted opposition, um, mm -hmm. not only to Paul, but to the gospel. Uh, uh, it's amazing how the world will unite against the Christians. Yeah, yeah. I know on one occasion he uh, mentioned that no man stood with him. He, he, Hope that uh, he prayed that it wouldn't be held against him. But I, I see him, you know, standing his ground and there. But God gave him the word to say to uh, defeat the accusations and uh, opposition right, the right. forces. But uh, uh, it was, uh, he was one man against many. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he, 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 that was all right with him, too. Because <laughs> he knew that the law was by his side. So should we. I feel like we as people of God, oftentimes we live in a world that's, uh, that's sometimes against us, you know, and, and, and I, I sometimes I feel a little bit loath uh, to say this because uh, it's easy for me to say that, right, uh, living in our country. And, but, I mean, we, we really don't know what it's like for the world to be against us, but but we, we do bear some of it, right? But certainly Christians in some other countries, they feel it, they live this, right? And so the world, they have the burden of the world in opposition against them, but they still stay strengthened and comforted knowing that if the Lord is for us, then who can be against us? And that's the attitude that we have to have as Christians that, look, no matter what happens to me, I mean, because life, Paul had a life of, of, of abandon, right? He, he, he has, at this point in his life, abandoned who he is. And he, he even reached a point who said to me, I, it don't matter if I live or die, you know? If I die, that'll be game for me, because that means I get to be with Jesus. But he's like, you know what? I'll go ahead and live. So that way I can be here for you. <laughs> you know, and so just imagine being that close to the Lord that you've reached a point in your life that you, you have so much abandoned that you say, Lord, whatever your will is, may it be done. May it be done. Don't know where that's going to lead me. Don't know where how I will end up, but it doesn't matter because it's not my will, but you will be done. That's that's a difficult place to get to as a Christian, right? Even as a Christian. It's a work in progress. But I think it is something we work towards. And Christians in many other nations, they're here already. They're already there based on the stuff that they've had to suffer. Based on all the death and separation that they see every single day. Stuff that we read about that happened 1,500 years ago is stuff that they still experience because for them it just happened earlier today. But to still say doesn't matter because it's not about what I want, it's about what God wants to accomplish through me. To reach that point, you know, when, when, when I see a person like that, like, am I really the Christian? That I'm supposed to be. I preach to 100, 885 people here every Sunday, an unknown number of people online. But that really made if am I really where I'm supposed to be? I'm just thinking aloud. <laughs> yes, sir. Even though Paul was a very strong person and yeah. very determined, uh, I see here in verse number 11, he had to be encouraged. He did. He, uh, he did, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So even though uh, uh, he's been standing a lot, God realized the, the, what he's going through, mm -hmm. and he's encouraging him. He's telling him, be of good cheer, Paul, absolutely. for thou had testified of me in Jerusalem. 
So must thou bear the struggle. So God realized the struggle that he's going through and he's encouraging him. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so even Paul, even the apostle Paul needed that encouragement. And y'all know how like we talked about earlier where you have the spirit informing Paul he would need to go to Jerusalem. And then you have a couple other what is this? And then you have a couple of no, it's an just for people at home, it was an insect. Like, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> 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 yeah. So the spirit tells he you gotta go to Jerusalem, but then he you, the spirit informs these others that he gotta go to Jerusalem, but the others tell him, please don't go to Jerusalem. Actually, I think part of that is showing Paul that I'm loved. That although I know that I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem, God is through these saints showing me that there are people who care about me. And so of all that Paul was, the mighty evangelist, the mighty missionary that he was, he himself needed to be Y'all, we all need some encouragement, don't we? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we all got to be encouraged. Yes, sir. Uh, this, this council, the makeup of the council, is uh, Pharisees and uh, Sadducees. So my question is, um, uh, are they all under Judaism, or were there some uh, Christians mixed in there also, as far as your knowledge of Scripture? I love I know, it. I, 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 I love to say it. there are absolutely no Christians. In here. <laughs> so, so the, these were these were individuals who, who at this point have not. You could remember you have some Pharisees who came to believe the truth and became Christians. So these were the ones who uh, who were part of the Roman Council. I mean, part of the Jerusalem, um, like the Sanhedrin and so forth. And so those have not become Christians. You know, so so that council at that point was actually going against the way what Paul calls the way, which is the way of Christ. And so these these were these were non Christians. Uh, these, these were part of the, the the Jewish establishment, the religion, the religious establishment. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, with Paul, you know, he really was doing the brunt, you know of the work you know he was doing those things that really you know his life was put on the line you know he was doing the, the hard things and so you would think you know that the church itself you know would be able to be strong enough to basically what he said keep the wolves out you know and continue you know to in the teachings and continue to do what it is that is pleasing to god but you know that same question you had, like, where was the church, you know, when all of this was happening? You know, it's kind of like the same idea that I was thinking, too, in my head as I read through these. Um, because you wonder, you know, what happens when um, what happens when society gets, like, crazy? You know, we know Paul had a mission. He had to go to Jerusalem, and then he was going to go to Rome. We, we knew that that was his mission that he had to, you know, do because he was going to preach, you know, not just there in Jerusalem, but he was going to go and to teach in Rome so that everyone, you know, would be able to hear. But, you know, after all these things are put in place, it's like, you know, he can't keep going back and putting things back in place. And, you know, it's it's for the church to continue it and to, to move forward. So when we think about us today, you know, like, what are we doing to continue it? Are we allowing others to come in and tell us how things are supposed to be done? Or do we set the standard from what's written in God's exactly. word and keep out what needs to be out? And even those that are within that's trying to stir up something that, you know, cut that loose as well. Like, when do we decide that it's time for us to do that and not allow others to come in and do this? Because the hard part, you know, was done so that we wouldn't have to do those pieces. You know, that's that's a good question. I mean, that's 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 something that. You know, we could discuss for a long time and still probably not come up with the, with, you know, because I think the issue with um, the issue with the, the early church is the same issue with today's church that a lot of a lot of the 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 error, a lot of the occurrences which occur that should not occur, it doesn't come from people on the outside coming in. They come from people who are already in, 
and and uh, and and that's 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 what we see clearly throughout the scriptures, you know. And and you and and the Bible has set up levels of defense against it, right? You know, he, he tells Timothy. So the, you have you have the evangelist, who's the guard, what, what Paul calls the guardian of like I think like the guardian of the gospel or something like that. The, the, to maintain that which I entrusted to you, I think is how he put it. And then the evangelists also teach and establish elders. And then the elders are the next line of defense. And then after that, you have you have teachers and the whole church who should be able and learn it enough to know false doctrine when they hear it. But at the end of the day, you have to go back to the Holy Scriptures. And so any time that people are are willing, whether uh, whether they want to do it or whether it's through ignorance, to walk outside of the scriptures. <coughs> You're right. Where, 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 where do where, you know? How does that work? But the issue <coughs> is, is that what if what if we don't know it, right? What 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 if what if what if what if the evangelist is the one who's teaching it. What if the the elders don't know it if they hear it? What if the church is unaware? And so that's why the the the, the supreme uh, yes and no is always the whole the, the word of God. And that's very different. That that's that's one thing I like about the Church of Christ. And I'm, I'm saying this for us, but also I'm saying it for everybody who's listening this evening online, who may not be a part of the Church of Christ. One of the things that you have to know about the Church of Christ is that when it comes to what's right and wrong, it's declared by the Holy Scriptures. Like that is our standard. It doesn't. It like we don't have the ability to declare what's right and wrong. Right now, well, what about the apostles? Well, don't forget the apostles were guided by the Holy Spirit. Right, but now today we have the written word, and the written word is the basis, the foundation for everything that we do teach and believe. And if we walk outside of that, remember Paul says, I don't care if an angel from heaven came down and told you anything differently. The fact is, that angel needs to be a curse. Because if you have the scriptures, or if you have an angel from heaven, the angel is the one that's wrong, not the scriptures. And so everything that we do and teach must, must coincide with the Bible. And, and so, but again, the issue is that a lot of the stuff that's not coinciding has not come from people on the outside. It's come from people on the inside. Don't we see that at Jerusalem Church of Christ, by the way? We read it down through Acts chapter 21, right? And, and they told Paul that we got all these members here. This is what they believe, and here's what they think about you. And, and I, I read one guy, one guy said, maybe if the apostles there, it wouldn't have happened. But remember, Paul even had to yeah. set Peter straight. Yeah, exactly. yeah. you know, and, and so I, I, this, this is my, the scriptures is the ultimate basis and foundation for everything. That I believe that if you find it in the scriptures, you teach it. You can't find it in the scriptures, don't teach it. Yes, I just want to say quickly uh, that you mentioned that back in Galatians chapter 1. He said that again, that's his explanation point. In other words, I don't care who he is, if he teaches anything like that, this one I've been taught. You know, uh, it's a bit of friction. Yeah. But it's just one of the things, even for us, it is so clear to us this day and time when it comes to, say, baptism. Mm -hmm. For someone to say, oh, you don't need that. Yeah, and just like if you make it a cake and you take out specific. Yes, yes, yes. You take them one part out, you take yeah. this you try to make. Yeah. And I think this applies, it do apply to the gospel. Yeah. You can't have one part of it. That's right. That's right. You know, and, and thank you for saying that, bro. And matter of fact, I think that's a good point for us to close on. Let me get, go ahead. No, no, no. No, because no, I'm about to close, so whatever you go ahead. Well, I was going to say that before. You talk about community medical every time that dealt. Um, and the kids of the scriptures, I mean, I, I remember that time, one time when Ben had, had this son, he said, uh, everything possible, he said, he, he believed, he said, I believe, hit my unbelief. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't want to admit that I, that, that I have a question I want to ask you, because somebody may think, well, I don't know no better. No, I, I need, 
and they create, freely created a healing community so I can ask a question. I don't know the answer. What should I do, Michael? You know, and he helped me, and I'd not be embarrassed to ask him right. to help me in the scripture. When we have Bible class and everybody asks ask, ask questions, I said, ask the question. Because we need to, I need to learn. We, we need to learn. And some, I think maybe we have, a, we have a culture that I don't want to ask questions because people think I'm silly. You know, that, that, no, no, I need to be able to. Uh, we need to create a community to ask questions so we can get get the scripture answer for our uh, scripture question. But I think sometimes we look at the answer not correct the man in, in the heat of the sun. I believe but him, I'm, I have the growth to do. The possible everybody has growth to do. So it's no harm that I don't know some things that I need to ask for help on. And let's create a community so people can ask questions and get answers they can continue to grow and not go away not knowing things and they want to ask it. That was the that's that's the problem that we encounter today, and that's the problem with the Pharisees, and that's the problem when Christians have a Pharisaic mentality, is that we know it all. Why should I ask a question if I already know the answer? And so we come to Bible class not to not to ask questions, not to learn, but just to yeah. And and so it, it's that's why it's so important for us to develop a thirst. Number one, develop a thirst for the Word of God, but then number two, develop some humility. That let yourself know there's so much about the word I don't know. There's some, there's, I mean, the Bible's a big book, you know, and and uh, and, and and I I know how it is, you know. I, I you know just you know being around you know the preachers and like man this guy was preaching for this long, you know, it don't, it don't matter, you know. And, and so like um, like I you know I I, I, don't, I don't you know. When you're preaching for church, you stay busy enough, so I don't really have time to listen. Like I know a lot of people in the audience, they like listening to different. I, I wish I had time to do that because I like hearing other preachers too, you know. But but um, but um, but one one thing deals is that I don't care if a preacher is 14 years old. I, I don't, you know, if, if somebody's 14 and they're using the scriptures, let me hear them. If, if there's something I can learn, I want to learn, right? You know, and I I've been doing this for I've been I've been preaching for like like 30 years. And, and, and I mean, you know, pretty good study, you know, you know, training, and, you know, homiletics and hermeneutics and exegesis, all this stuff. You know, I'm, I know a little bit is probably what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but the fact is, is that I never could grow to a point where I say, this guy who has never been to no seminary, that I can't learn that from him. I mean, why? You know, as a matter of fact, not until I went to seminary is when I realized how much I didn't know. <laughs> and, and, and what we'll see is that the more of a thirst that you develop in studying the Word of God, the more you study the Word of God, the more you realize you don't know. But I like that because that gives me a thirst to even go deeper and want to know more. You know, there's times that I go to the Bible and I'm like, man, I mean, I, that, that just helped me research. I'm like, I'm, I'm researching everywhere, and that just made me even want to go and learn more and more about it. And, and so, uh, so you just got to develop a thirst. But you gotta have humility when you come to the Word of God. You, if you don't have humility, you know what's gonna happen? Not exegesis, but eisegesis. Instead of bringing from the text what the text is saying, what you do is bring to the text what you want the text to say. And so that's what we have to avoid. And see, that's what the Pharisees did because that's the kind of mentality they have. You asked a very good question earlier, brother, or how. Were, were those Pharisees, uh, Sadducees, were they Christians? My question for us is, how many Christians today are Pharisees? <laughs> so, Brother Anderson, you mentioned earlier about baptism. That's one teaching. That is one teaching that the world says, you really ain't, really ain't got to be baptized. But when you read throughout the book of Acts, when people were converted, when people were being saved, they were what? They're baptized. So my question is, who changed the word of God? At what point did somebody step up and say, you know what? I know God sent Jesus a long time ago, but he's sending me now. And I'm going to teach the exact opposite of what Jesus and the apostles taught. You ain't got to be baptized. You know, Paul said, like I said earlier, even the angel of heaven say something different. Let him be a curse. So somebody needs to be a curse. When it comes to our soul salvation, don't do it man's way is what I'm saying. Don't do it man's way. Go strictly by the Holy Bible. According to the Bible, you come to Christ by first hearing the message of salvation, the fact that Jesus died, he was buried, rose again, third day, believe that, 
you pay your sins, confess, be buried in the liquid tomb of baptism. In the water, you make contact with the blood. Christ will wash away all your sins. You rise up a new creation in Jesus Christ. Saved, you will be the Lord will add you to his church, not another man's church, but his church. And you will be a child of God. If there's anyone who can be saved this evening, now is your opportunity. If you're at home, scan the QR code, fill it out the response card, and we'll contact you. May God bless you. May God keep you. Thank you very much. I want to thank Brother Parker for the message tonight, the lesson on the, the book of Acts. Uh, it's a very interesting study. I uh, always uh, enjoy uh, uh, learning more about uh, what Paul did on his journeys. Uh, each time you, you read the book of Acts, you always learn something new. And relating that to some of his epistles, uh, it just helps you to continue to grow. And we always need to continue to, to study God's word that we can have a better understanding of what his uh, will is for us to do. Thank Brother Parker for the lesson tonight and thank everyone for being here this afternoon. We have two cards that we should read and then we'll have a uh, uh, we'll closing out in a prayer. First of all, Brother Jimmy Isaac, he says, uh, please pray for, for a friend and golf buddy named Wes Wesley who was recently placed in hospice, pray for his family. Also prayers for a cousin, uh, Calvin Adams family for the loss of Calvin. And brother Leslie Russell um, has a request for wellness uh, medical appointment uh, on April 19th at the VA hospital. And I think uh, Sister Didi has a request. Special prayer for Miss Catherine Taylor. She's going to get a tube inserted into her tomorrow for feeding. And they need prayers. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, let us go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you've given us this day. Thank you so much, Father, for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you so much, Father, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to come into the world and go to the cruel cross of Calvary and suffer and uh, die and shed his blood for our sins and thank you father for raising from the grave that we may have continually father a relationship with you father we continue to pray for your church especially for the congregation here and pray for each and every member father we pray now for those who have requested prayers uh, we pray for the request of sister diana uh, for the the person that's uh, having an amputation and for the other uh, uh, lady who's uh, having uh, uh, a medical procedure done, and we pray, Father, that you would be with uh, those ladies and grant them, Father, uh, the ability to recover from the illness that they are going through and continue, Father, to give them strength, continue to be with uh, the those that are helping her, helping them uh, to recover from their illness. Father, we want to pray for Brother Leslie Russell as he... Uh, has a medical appointment on uh, at the VA hospital, and we pray for all that that appointment goes well and everything uh, uh, we will will be well with that appointment. And we pray for the continued recovery of, of Brother Russell. Father, now we pray for uh, Wes Wesley, Father, and we pray for his family, Father, as he's re recently placed in hospice and. We know, Father, that you are in control of this world, and control uh, is up to you, Father, as to when life ends. And we pray, Father, that if it be your will, that you would grant him his life, grant him his health, grant him his strength. But, Father, pray for his family as they continue to serve as a source of strength to him, continue to strengthen them, Father, as they're, uh, uh, as they're going through uh, helping him, Father, to... Uh, to uh, go through uh, uh, this period of time that's in his life. Father, now we also pray for uh, the Calvin uh, Adams family, that you would be with them, Father, uh, in the bereavement of, uh, of Calvin Adams, that you would strengthen the family. Father, give them strength, strength as they uh, uh, are in bereavement at this time. Father, we also want to continue to remember the 
uh, Brother Owens, Roy Owens family, and all the related families. Father, that you would be with them uh, as they are going through bereavement. Continue to be with the church here and pray, Father, we may continue to, to love your word and continue to love one another and always work united and put you first in everything that we do. Forgive us of our sins. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.